Hi, Connor. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Doing all right. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Connor Friedersdorf, staff writer at The Atlantic. Yes. Uh, and... Editor of the Best of Journalism newsletter. The Best of Journalism. Now, that's interesting. So that's still... You started that quite some time ago. Years and yeah, years. Back years before now. newsletters were cool. Yeah. And uh, they've gotten easier to do now. But mm -hmm. I'm still chugging along with, you know, 2,500, 3,000 subscribers. And it's just... The best stuff I'm reading each week linked. So mm -hmm. it's cheaper you're, than the other newsletters and uh, it's good. But you're not on Substack like the cool kids. No, I'm thinking, you know, should I switch to Substack or should I stick with MailChimp and Stripe, which is what I'm on now, or mm -hmm. should I do both? I don't know. Um, you know, I've had the experience before of Amazon payments just disappearing for newsletters years ago and having to kind of scramble. So maybe I should be in two places at once. I don't know. The, the fascinating Never know. Uh, Substack uses Stripe as a payment system and uh, and promises that you can take your financial relationships with you should you leave the platform. But I digress. Although we are going to get into platforms. All right. Because what I want to talk about uh, is, uh, well, broadly speaking, the seemingly precarious state of the American Republic, uh, mm -hmm. the polarization and tribalism that afflict it. Uh, and in fact, one reason I wanted to have you on is because you're one of the least tribalistic and uh, least polarizing uh, people in journalism, I think, and one of the journalists most earnestly concerned with this very problem. And I know you have uh, a pin clear, uh, pretty strong opinions about some of these uh, deplatforming issues that are now suddenly part of the story here. The uh, I'm sure most people are aware. Uh, that um, Trump has been kicked off of Twitter and uh, Parler. The Twitter alternative seems to itself be being deplatformed in various ways we can talk about. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there is impeachment afoot and there is the question of whether that's going to make things better or worse and so on. So there's plenty to talk about. But before I get specific uh do you just have any general reactions to the state of play in america i guess my my kind of overarching reaction is that this is a moment of pretty clear national trauma and a lot of people feel myself included that uh, a kind of um symbolic there's been a symbolic attack on american democracy and meaning the storming of the capital in particular meaning the storming of the capital yeah uh -huh. And I tend in moments like this in, you know, as after the Oklahoma City bombing and 9-11 and, and not that I was alive, but, but Pearl Harbor, to think both that this sort of thing demands a response and also that uh, because it is an outrage, uh, people tend to overreact and to do some things that turn out to be counterproductive, that um, have collateral damage and harm innocence. And so I think we ought to think very carefully in these moments um, and, you know, not let not let this do to us what 9-11 did to Dick Cheney, not start um, mm -hmm. becoming super paranoid and betraying a lot of long held values in order to, uh, you know, make sure that we overreact instead of underreacting. Yeah. And what strikes me is how little... Uh reflection there's been on that question in a certain sense. I mean, by and large, the discourse you see surrounding the deplatforming decisions and the decision to impeach and so on is pretty largely devoid of tactical consideration, it seems to me. Like, I just haven't seen many people on Twitter saying, but wait a second, couldn't this make things worse? I mean, couldn't like, you know, various questions. I mean, I've asked a couple of questions uh, on Twitter, like, uh, it's kind of spooky if Trump's not on Twitter, we have much less insight into the current state of his mental health. That kind of scares me. I, I almost want to be able to monitor the guy. That, uh, you know, and then there's the question of, you know, it, do we want to create a society in which um, there are these ideologically distinct platforms? Right. Um, and so you get less ideological interaction, uh, you know, in Cindy areas that may sometimes be. Anyway, 
there's a ton of, uh, you know, there's very little tactical reflection, I would, I would say. Yeah, and I, I find myself being very skeptical of anyone who is certain because all of these questions seem very thorny to me and to have a lot of trade-offs. Just to take one, um, it's not just a question of what the reaction to some of these things is going to be, but that there could be um, different reactions, both of which, um, you, know, you know, that are split. For example, impeaching Trump could send the signal to lots of people that um, the kind of rhetoric he engaged about uh, the election is beyond the pale in American politics, and that might be a good thing. And it also might further radicalize the far, far fringe in a way that spurred terrorist attacks. And how would that shake out? How many people would die in those terrorist attacks? Right. It's very tricky when you have both, you know, 74 million people or so who voted for Trump and also a fringe that do not represent all of those 74 million. And we don't really have any idea um, how that shakes out, how unrepresentative they are, how many people would be radicalized, what information they're getting, how they would react to these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But you're right that I don't see a ton of even attempts to discuss these sorts of questions um, when we're thinking about the question of impeachment or deplatforming for that matter. Yeah. I mean, one thing I've noticed, you know, I, for better or worse, had months ago gotten into the habit of listening with at least some frequency to Steve Bannon's podcast because it seemed to me it was a good way to monitor a very important part of the Trumpist media ecosystem. I mean, super important. I think he's yeah. almost as responsible as any single person for the whole Stop the Steal movement having gotten to the point where there was a storming of the Capitol. And I just, I saw a lot of things coming for months now as a result of listening to the podcast. And and after, um, you know, January 6th, I mean, I was wondering, like on January 5th, I was thinking two things. One thing was they better have the Capitol well protected. I was thinking that by virtue of having listened to his podcast. Yeah. But I was also thinking, uh, okay, so after tomorrow, it's going to be clear. Trump has, has just lost the election. And Bannon's going to have to kind of admit that. And that's going to be awkward for him because he had been guaranteeing his followers, we're going to prevail. And and I was curious as to what's going to happen uh, with his whole uh, rhetorical line. And I was thinking, you know, he's going to have some awkward explaining to do. And and uh, and then after the uh, the kind of insurrection or whatever you want to call it on Cap on uh, uh, Capitol Hill, I was briefly thinking, oh, now he's in even worse shape because all these Republicans are turning on Trump. And so now, um, you know, it, it's just, uh, you know, Trump is just kind of stewing in his own juice. And it's like and it's like he's really got an uphill struggle now. But I've noticed that since, you know, between the impeachment and the deplatforming, he's got a new war to fight. He can yeah. change the subject now. Mm -hmm. People might say, OK, but at least he's not on YouTube because, you know, he got deplatformed from YouTube yeah. uh, like a couple of days ago. But I'll tell you, rhetorically, he is in a much better position with his followers than he would be if he just, you know, in the absence of the opposition he now faces. So that's one little data point. He's fired up. They're fired up. Yeah. And and they've got and, and he has a totally new focal point. He doesn't even have to address the question of what happened to the old focal point. You know, the the hill they were going to take, you know, when Trump was going to eventually win the election. He's yeah. just now able to change the subject. Yeah. You know, one thing that I think kind of broadly speaking about all of these questions is that you go a long way toward um, reducing everyone's anxieties if you seem to be making principled decisions that you're applying in a way that isn't ideologically biased. And so... You know, as someone who um, is pretty far on the free speech side of things generally, I actually wrote a piece back in 2018 saying that if I were running Twitter, I would just not have world leaders on Twitter. That would be my <laughs> um, solution to this intractable problem, right? And this was right after Trump was engaging in some kind of nuclear saber, ra saber rattling with the head of North Korea, right? The kind mm -hmm. of thing that you don't want to happen on Twitter. You know, this is a platform that does not. Um, bring out the cool heads in people. It, it rewards impulsiveness and escalation and rhetoric. And so, um, you know, to me, it, you could hardly design a platform that was worse to have 
the leaders of nuclear armed powers on. Um, world leaders are distinct in that they um, have plenty of ability to get their voices out when they're in office. Uh, it wouldn't really affect public discourse in a bad way, I don't think, to have them off of Twitter. And you solve the problem uh, if you just say, we're not going to have any of them, right? You solve the problem of, are we going to kick China's leader off because of the Wagner concentration camps, Iran's leader off because he says something about Israel, Israel's lead, right? You get rid of all these thorny questions that are very politically fraught and that lots of people will react to in polarized ways by just saying, look, our platform has strengths and it has weaknesses and having world leaders on is not one of our strengths. And so in a very neutral way, we're going to get rid of all of them. And, you know, Biden too, when he comes into office would, would then lose his Twitter presence. I think that that sort of thing, solving problems in that sort of way, kind of tamps down the polarization, the feeling that people are having that you're taking away all of their ability to even dissent from a kind of growing consensus, right? And so uh, having written that back in 2018, all these years later, I think it's a defensible decision to kick Trump off Twitter. Um, my, my mixed feelings are partly because I think that if a non-powerful person uh, who engaged in the behavior that he did on Twitter for as long as they had would already have been banned. He was breaking terms of service pretty flagrantly right and left. It was only because of political bias in a way that he was still on it, you know, in that Twitter was kind of deferring to a powerful person and, and applying different rules actually to him than they do to regular users. And I think that that kind of cuts in favor of, of getting rid of him too. Um, now, we've already talked about how even though it's, I think, a defensible decision, it, it perhaps is not a prudent decision. We don't know the downside consequences. I could be kind of swayed either way about that. Uh, but another thing that I kind of don't like, just kind of in the pit of my stomach, is all of the platforms acting in concert, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, as long as the tech sector is relatively decentralized, then there are a bunch of different companies. I worry a lot less than what seems like a decision that was uh, motivated by political pressure because the Democrats are going to hold all of the committee chairs of, of um, committees that are important to these companies' interests, or just the public pressure of everyone yelling, do the same thing at once. And uh, so it, it certainly looks less like a principled decision evenly applied when all of the tech companies at once seem to act in concert. And with Trump, you can kind of say, well, this is a pretty sui generis thing where um, if anything is beyond the pale, surely it is inciting your followers to storm the Capitol. And so maybe they did just all act because they saw that and, and reacted appropriately. Um, with Parler, it seems a lot more dubious that that is the case. And when, when I look at the Parler, um, you know, so for people who don't know, Parler was kicked off of the Apple Store, the Google Play Store. And so. It yeah, so Parler is this Twitter alternative that. It styles itself as a free speech platform more than Twitter. Uh, but for that reason, it's become, in effect, a kind of right of center platform. It tends to be conservatives who go over there because they feel they're not welcome on uh, Twitter. Uh, right. Just to make sure people understand that it's it's one of several. There are these alternative platforms. Rumble is now the alternative to Zoom. Um Parlor and uh, there's one other that uh, kind of Twitter alternative, but 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 right, uh, yeah, yeah. To be clear, like there, there's deplatforming and there's kind of de meta platforming. <laughs> In other words, yeah. So you can kick people off of Facebook, off of Twitter, individual people. That's deplatforming. But Parlor uh, has a pretty heavy dependence on the Android and Apple ecosystems. Uh, you know. And Android and now is it the case that both Android and Apple have banned the Parler app, as yeah. well as Amazon now what had been providing the server support for Parler, and yeah. it has pulled that. I, I mean, you know, you shouldn't overstate the thing. I mean, you can get you can reach people on smartphones without apps. You can have a web based kind of quasi app that people can reach on a smartphone. And presumably, ultimately, they can find servers other than Apple's. You can, you can get servers that aren't Apple's or Microsoft's that aren't, you know, you can recover partly from that, but it is still a very serious obstacle. Right. It's um, a lot more like the power company shut off your power and, you know, eventually you can get 
a, a uh, some solar panels and a generator. Um, maybe not quite that extreme, but it, it is, um, yeah, it, it is more right. akin to that than it is merely not being available in one store. Right. And so when I think about Parler, I, I will be curious to see what evidence comes, you know, in coming days because it's pretty sketchy right now. The New York Times write up on it said that, said that Amazon cited 98 posts that it had flagged that were still up on the platform. And this is the reason that they withdrew their services. I find that very hard to believe. 98 posts in the context of these social media companies. My God, think of the 98 worst posts you could find on Facebook or Twitter uh, at any given moment, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So in part, this seems to me, if that is the real reason or even part of the real reason, it's worth mentioning the CEO of Parler did a interview with, um, with Kara Swisher where he described their rather unique um, mediation uh, or what's it called? Uh, moderation rather. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically that when something gets flagged, they have a jury of Parler users who are trained in various ways about the law and the terms of service. And it's a jury vote of whether a post gets you know, taken off hmm. or left up. And um, I've been thinking, what do I think about this? You know, it, it certainly um, has a claim to fairness in a way that the opaque moderation of the other platforms does not. You can also see how it could go wrong. Perhaps uh, professionalism in moderation rather than user moderation is better. I tend to want to see how this thing works out rather than to have a tech giants of the internet decide this is, you know, the way that Facebook moderates is how everyone must moderate. Um, And it it really, um, what I fear is that we're going to have legislation that comes soon that is going to lock in the Facebook and Twitter way of doing things as like the only competition, right? So like uh, in an obscure corner of my journalistic past, uh, I wrote a book about one of the founders of SeaWorld and they were, um, very scared about regulation in the early 60s about going out and collecting uh, marine mammals and fish from the ocean because at the beginning they would just go out in boats and take what they wanted and take it to SeaWorld and put it on display. And they fought um, every hint that they would be regulated for a long time. And then one day um, they figured out, wait a minute, if we write the rules for uh, what you have to do to get a marine mammal in captivity – then no one else is ever going to be able to start anything like we started ever again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be the giant forever. And that's more or less, um, more or less what happened. Um, I think it would be a shame at this early point in social media, if that happens with, you know, our existing social media players and with parlor, it it especially seems striking to me. Again, it could be that there uh, is stuff on the platform I don't know about that I would be persuaded if I sat down with the head of Amazon that they made the right call. I want to leave open that possibility. But it is striking to me that this is more or less in response to the storming of the Capitol. And where has Trump been doing all of his worst communications for years? Twitter. Uh, Where did most of the organizing for it take place? I have to imagine more on Facebook than Parler, given the infrastructure, right? I mean, Twitter isn't a place and Parler is much like Twitter in its infrastructure. It's not a place where you gather and plan things. That's what you do in a Facebook group or a signal thread or. Although I will say, you know, there was a New York Times reporter who did a really a a good piece and she was on the Daily Podcast talking about um, she's been following the right for a while and she was monitoring the storming of the Capitol and what was going on inside. And she was using Gab. That's the one I was trying to think of. That's the other alternative to kind of, I think, I think it's more like Twitter than Facebook. But that's where she was, I think, monitoring communications among some of the people in the Capitol and monitoring live video from inside the Capitol. So, yeah. I, I mean, it wouldn't shock me if there was some pretty intense right wing stuff going on there. But, but I, I, I totally buy your skepticism. I mean, I, there are no signs that this was thought through at all. I mean, for example, have you looked at Twitter's explanation for why they banned Trump? Yeah. It's pathetic. I'm, I'm I'm trying to remember now. I've read a well, bunch the of two tweets he focuses on, the two tweets they cite, one of them is him saying he's not going to the inauguration. And the uh, there, there are two of the I mean, that's kind of inflammatory. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but they I, said they, they took now. that as a signal that you could 
uh, attack uh, the inauguration without worrying about hurting him or something. Right, and yeah. and they took his use of the word uh, patriots to mean, you know, insurgents or something on the other tweet. That's not exactly the rationale, yeah. but it's it's real. It seems so strange. And yeah. I, I'm not I surprised. Really wish, I really wish that they would have said something like, um, we've allowed Donald Trump to stay on our platform for years, yeah. even as we've deeply disagreed with things he's been saying, and even as he's been breaking our terms of service left and right, because we thought he was the president and it was important. Now we regret that because he's done this thing that is just sui generis. It, nothing like it has happened uh, in the modern history of the United States. Right. And this is not a sign that we're going to kick off Trump supporting users. Uh, but it is a sign that if Trump or any president, um, you know, lies for months in a way that incites a mob to uh, storm the Capitol, that's a bridge too far. And maybe this is sui generis, but um, we want Trump users to know, Trump supporting users to know that they're still welcome here. That to me is the kind of, I mean, I substantively believe all that, that that's the right way to go, but it also strategically just seems much better than um, we're going to read between the lines of Trump's yeah. statements in a way that, you know, is it possible that the fringe looked at his inauguration statement that way? Sure. But it's guaranteed that most people who read it didn't look right. at it that way. And so you create a situation where millions of people are looking at that explanation and going, come on, that doesn't seem reasonable. Yeah. No, if they had even said, look, in retrospect, um, on the question of inciting the Capitol Hill mob, leave aside what he said at the speech. In retrospect, he's been kind of inciting something like this since the election. And here is a list of things he has tweeted that are just flatly untrue and right. have been debunked. And just a, you could have a very long list. I mean, uh, he, cause he's still saying things that are flatly untrue about, yeah. about the election. Um, and, yeah, and I agree. And and I don't think it was like genius to say he's suspended for life. First of all, what does that even mean? Suspended implies temporary and they're saying kind of forever. But also when they put it like that, they're just encouraging his uh, followers to uh, leave them, you know, for uh, parlor. Of course, that was uh, before it was deplatformed. But I, I don't I just uh, I don't know. Yeah. I just don't see signs of much forethought. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I my instinct is like we want we want we want the fringe on parlor as opposed to some platform that is closed to outsiders, I would think. Um, right. Like I, you know, I well, keep hearing a, about how security researchers were monitoring all the platforms in the lead up to the Capitol and they knew something was coming and they were sounding alarm bells. Uh, I would like to have alarm bells like that. When well, something that's like that's what's happening. weird. You know, right after this happened, Jack Dorsey who continues to not impress me with the depth of his reflection. Yeah. Uh, would, did I saw one of his tweets and all it was, was an image of the app Signal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, is he saying, hey, wait a second, Trump supporters, you always have Signal. Well, Signal is encrypted. I mean, do right. we, is that what we want? I mean, wouldn't we rather have them out in the open? I yeah. mean, I, I think I'd rather have them on Twitter. Yeah. And and if they're not going to be on Twitter, I, I'd rather have them uh, like you on something we can observe. And I just see no signs that anybody has, yeah, has you know, thought this through. I've been on – I don't know if you have heard of Clubhouse, uh, no. which is a relatively new app that has pretty heavy um, backing from, from big venture capital guys. And it is um, – it's been focused on the music and tech industry – uh, early on, but it's a drop-in audio app, right? So you would open your phone and you would look and there'd be maybe 40 or 50 different rooms and you go into one and it might have three or four people or it might have hundreds of people, right? And it might be anything from a discussion. It, it might be, this is a real example, MC Hammer talking about tech investment with a bunch of people who want to invest in tech, right? Uh, but it also might be a bunch of people that you've never heard of um, talking about really any topic under the sun. And there have been some pieces about how can Clubhouse um, not moderate its content better. And it's dangerous to have people gathering like this. Uh, what's funny is that um, it's almost getting to the point where people are demanding content moderation 
uh, like where you're going to hear that oh, this bar lets people just go in and talk and say whatever they want without anyone moderating it, without any moderators present to go around and make sure no one is saying anything that is untoward, right? Um, it, it's interesting to see, you know, drop in audio if you think about it. It's not like Twitter where misinformation, say, or incitement can be amplified immediately with a bunch of retweets to millions of people. Um, this is ephemeral. It's only the people in the room that are hearing and it drifts off into the ether. And so there's a lot less potential for harm in this medium. And yet still psychologically, people don't like the idea of someone saying something that they don't like uh, and not being punished for it. Right. Like apart from the harm, you saw the same thing with this app called Yik Yak that used to be around college campuses. And that app was such that it, it only showed you what people within like five miles of you or one mile, I forget what it was, was saying. Oh, right, right. It was right. mostly on college campuses and it was anonymous. And people would say things on it that people were certainly saying elsewhere in the community. You know, they would say, um, you know, um, you know, say that it was at UCLA during a football game and it might be like, oh, look at that person in the band. That person is fat, right? And people would object to this and say, this is horrible and, and it hurts people's feelings and blah, blah, blah. And of course, if you were sitting in the stadium, there would have been people who said that and far worse. Um, but the idea of, I know someone near this is saying it to me and I don't have control over it psychologically mm -hmm. is hard for people um, because it transgresses against their values. And they could do it anonymously, yeah. right? Yeah, and they could do it anonymously. Which is another difference. Well, which is another difference, yeah. yeah. Well, although not different than Twitter, right? You can go on Twitter anonymously. No, and... just different than what you'd hear in real life. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so um, I, I think that people have a really hard time um, wrestling with the idea of people are going to express things that might be immoral and that might have, you know, values that are very different from mine. And um, they have a hard time separating that from the kind of harms that we ought to think about and that ought to be subject to regulation, I think. Mm -hmm. And we see that distinction in real life speech a lot better than we do in online spaces. Mm -hmm. Now, I assume you agree with me that this isn't the First Amendment issue because this isn't the government shutting them down. Yeah, I agree. At, at the same time, <laughs> these are pretty powerful actors. They are. I mean, all along when people talk about, you know, how much, how oppressive China is online, I think, how far are we? I mean, we, there is so much concentration of power. That, uh, you know, uh, I've wondered, like, how far are we from seeing an example of, of, of that degree of centralization yeah. of um, censorship? Yeah. And we're, we're just about there, right? I mean, th this, this shows you how I'm not saying that these companies uh, orchestrated this. Uh, these whatever it is, four or five companies. Um, I mean, what is it? So it's it's. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Apple, Google together, uh, and well, and Amazon at the server level. Um, but it's uh, collectively they have the, you know, they have almost not quite as much power as China's government, but you're getting there. It's, it's. Yeah. I mean, look, if, if at the beginning of the, the, post George Floyd Black Lives Matter protests or, you know, back after, in Ferguson, when it, when it all began, right? If, if all the tech companies said, we're going to kick the Black Lives Matter activists off this platform, mm -hmm. it's not a First Amendment issue, it's our right. They would be right that it isn't a First Amendment issue. Lots of the people saying, we don't need to worry about this, it's just a private company making their own decision, would be furious and would be concerned, and rightly so. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, that we should have concern, uh, especially to the degree that these are monopolies and you can't go anywhere else, right? And it's a little bit tricky to think about because, you know, some of these companies are, their business is the ad business, right? And they're not exactly monopolies in the space of selling ads. It's not like an old case of a business monopoly exactly. Um, at the same time, um, do they have a monopoly in public discourse? Like you can make arguments both ways. Twitter? Uh, as, as I think Matt Iglesias is pointing out, um, you know, only about 33% of Americans have even heard of Twitter. Um, 
And worldwide, they have like 300 million users outside the United States, I think, total. And so um, it's certainly much smaller than Facebook, especially. Sure, sure but it is also too. more it is also more elite. It is, it is, you know, the journalists, the scholars, the I mean, it is the, uh, right. you know, elite. I don't mean I mean, in the sociological sense of the term yeah. elite, like disproportionately influential people in the various professions, certainly including politicians, journalists, public intellectuals, artists, blah, 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 business community. Yeah. It 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 has in that sense there is a tremendous amount of power yeah. in the in the communication that is collectively Twitter and in fact many things that wind up spreading on Facebook start on Twitter. Yeah. Even the famous blue dress gold dress <laughs> meme. That's I think that started on Twitter and then really went viral on on Facebook which is more of a right. grassroots things and both of them have their kind of power but right. I certainly don't think that some kind of quantitative comparison between the number of users uh, tells the story and in the recent past Facebook was something that you know if you applied for a job at a lot of companies and you didn't have a Facebook profile you'd be looked on with a little bit of suspicion like what are mm -hmm. you trying to hide um, I don't think that's true anymore I think that younger people have kind of um, abandoned well, they're, on, they're on Instagram and other yeah. things for one thing. But. Yeah. Uh, and, and so these things are very fluid and it's very hard to predict, you know, um, perhaps everyone will be on TikTok in 10 years and both Facebook and Twitter will be something that old people use. Right. Um, perhaps not. Perhaps these will stick around for a long time. If thinking about the government regulating these, I mean, so David French, who I think actually may have changed his position after the um, capital storming, um, has argued before that these companies should just apply the First Amendment, which would be um, more permissive than they are in many ways. Um, and if the, you know, if the government were to nationalize them, not that I think that's going to happen, but I've seen people suggest it, then they would have to apply the First Amendment. Um, and you can also think about like if if there were already a precedent for the heavy handed regulation of these platforms, if the government was going to set the rules, as Angela Merkel suggested they should in a statement against banning Trump, uh, what would Trump and the Republicans have done when they held both houses of Congress? What you know, for, not that they were around then, but um, what would the Bush administration uh, have done right after 9-11? Um, it's it's far from clear that the government would be making better decisions than the um, that than even the kind of um, colluding tech quasi monopolists that make me uncomfortable. And yeah. I, I do think that there's something to even if we don't like the power of the tech monopolies, at least they're a different center of power mm -hmm. and we have different centers of power, um, which could be very useful. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I guess there's a couple of ways you could go. Uh, you could, I mean, I suppose at one extreme, you could, I guess if you declared them common carriers, if you redefine them as common carriers, you would be in effect imposing the first amendment on them almost. Cause they would have to carry everybody, right? That, that they would not have the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the option of kicking people off. Um, I, I don't think right now you're going to get much political support for that. The um, I, I mean, another thing that I've long favored that doesn't go very far toward um, toward making me relax about all this, but I think would be something is just where you can break them up. Facebook should not have Instagram and Facebook and WhatsApp. Break them up into three companies. I would say break up Google search from YouTube. Uh, Twitter is only Twitter. Uh, you know, and maybe with Amazon, you might do certain things with, with Amazon as well, but that doesn't take you very far. But I do think more decentralized is better. Uh, you know, more different companies that, uh, that have some degree of leverage over uh, mass communications, uh, is better than fewer. But uh, beyond that, I don't have, uh, an obvious cure. Yeah. And I think it's also worth mentioning that, um, you know, this this event that is very serious by any account happens and people understandably uh, want to 
um, send a signal that it must not happen again. And, and you know, to be clear, um, yeah. as far as identifying and prosecuting the people that were storming the Capitol, um, it, it's <laughs> the most law and order that I ever feel is right now. Uh, and I'm kind of astonished that they all were carrying so many cameras that they were photographing themselves with at all times. Um, it's kind of astonishing that this was, this was not a risk averse group of people. No. Um, I don't know if it was lack of risk aversion or delusion or I, I don't know. I, I, I still wrestle with. And well, I think some that. of them, there was a certain amount of flat out delusion, uh, yeah. you know, QAnoners who thought this was the moment when light would yeah. prevail over darkness, certain amount of that. But then also it's like, what kind of, what kind of people storm the Capitol? They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're the kinds of people that would start a fight in a nightclub or various. I mean, they're just not yeah. risk averse people. You know? Yeah. But yeah. But so, so I hear calls to have a new domestic terrorism law and uh, I uh, am terrified of that. I, I, yeah. I think that certainly post 9-11, we passed all the laws we would ever need to prosecute terrorism. And I don't think it will be any problem to prosecute the people who actually stormed the Capitol. Um, but but as for the people who didn't storm the Capitol, who are just the rest of of Trump supporters, some of whom are um, furious that this happened and and hate that people stormed the Capitol, and some of whom are kind of quasi sympathetic to it. Um, when they look at Trump getting banned, uh, and they look at you know Parler going away, um, the context for them, and I think reasonably for all of us, is not. Um, you know, everyone was okay with broad political speech before this. And then this happened and there was in their minds an overreaction to it, but rather um, their speech has been being attacked left and right at every turn in the media and academia um, in tech platforms for years now. And, um, you know, this is certainly the case, right? Like it isn't just the Trump supporter that feels like they can't, speak their minds in the elite public square, right? It's, it's a whole bunch of, you know, it's Andrew Sullivan and Matt Iglesias feel this way, um, right? That, that they didn't fit into the kind of elite um, institutions that they were a part yeah, of. Yeah, although there the problem was more their media outlets as opposed to social, yeah. the media outlets they happen to work for. Yeah, well, absolutely. actually, Matt, uh, I forget, anyway, the, the, neither one of them has run into trouble on social media, but... right. I mean, cancel culture is a somewhat different topic. Yeah, well, it, it's it's only to say that um, there is a, you know, what one can argue about how big it is. Um, you know, I don't think that this characterizes the whole left. I think that like most people, most Democrats do not want to cancel Andrew Sullivan or or Matt Iglesias, clearly. Um, I think it's a it's a relatively small number of people. Um, however, um you know, whether it's publishing houses uh, and, and book authors, whether it's media companies, whether it's universities and what kind of speech gets you, um, you know, gets your admissions revoked or gets um, you in trouble if you're a professor, right? Um, there is an uptick in policing of speech across, um, across the elite culture. And it is not unreasonable for um, Trump supporters to see this as an escalation of that rather right. than an isolated event in response to the Capitol storming and to worry that in the future, they and their kids or whatever are not going to be able to participate. Um, they're going to be discriminated against on an ideological basis. And um, I think anyone in their position, um, if the roles were reversed, would feel exactly the same way. Um, I, I, I think that it's it's totally understandable that they feel that way. And um, you know, I say this again as someone who thinks that it's totally defensible to kick Trump off of Twitter, uh, even though I worry about whether it's the right move strategically. Um, but um, I think but for that social context, um, you know, in the same way, I think that um, the, the what about ism about, oh, well, what about the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer? Right. Many people are using that as a dodge and comparing unlike things. And it isn't as if. Um, there were 120 member Democratic members of Congress who were like, yes, it's OK to burn and loot cities. Right. Um, right. That's ridiculous. You can look at, you know, Ilhan Omar, one of the most left wing members of Congress who was complaining about riots. And yet, at the same time, you would be correct if you were um, looking for hypocrisy to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I thought we had to defund the police and I thought that showing up in 
in large forces. I, I, I thought that like sending the National Guard was a danger to reporters who were on the scene and that, um, you know, uh, a show of force is going to um, agitate protesters into uh, being a violent mob and that we should have a less demilitarized presence going in uh, if we want them to stay calm, right? All of these things that uh, different arguments are being made when it's the out group on the other side. And um, I, I think it's something that, especially when you keep in mind the way that social media tends to show us the most extreme and unreasonable positions from the other side mm -hmm. and lure us into the idea that that is the median instead of the outlier. Mm -hmm. And then you put yourself in the mindset of people who watched, say, Antifa attacking the federal courthouse in Portland for like weeks and weeks, setting it on fire, shooting fireworks at it, clashing right. with cops every day. And it sure made it seem to a lot of people like you could engage in relatively rough and tumble protests, not killing, you know, any of the people who are defending the Portland courthouse. Certainly. I don't think that anyone thought that you could get away with that, but I wonder if some of the people who thought that they could get away with storming the Capitol um, thought so in part because there seemed to be a more permissive um, attitude toward this sort of thing. Um, I think that that was a misimpression on their part. They don't mm -hmm. see the people who are actually getting arrested in Portland. There are some, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I'm never very confident in what the stream that other people are getting at looks like and what they might reasonably infer from the... Um, from the unrepresentative stuff that they're seeing. And I think that that kind yeah. of thing is worth thinking through. There's another analogy there, um, I think, between the summer protests and this, which is that, you know, to people who support the Black Lives Matter protests, there's a very clear distinction between the protesters and the looters, between the protesters and Antifa. And it's like they'd be saying, no, you don't understand. It's like there's the protesters and then there's the bad guys. And right now, a lot of Trump supporters, I think, are thinking the same thing. They're yeah. thinking, OK, there were, you know, uh, there were real bad actors. And then right. there were probably some people who followed them into the cap capital thinking like, well, this is at most a misdemeanor. But in their mind, they're thinking, but this is different from the whole Trump movement. Don't you understand? And right. And that's the way they're thinking about it. And that's why, to them, it is such an affront for kind of Trump himself to be attacked. Now, you and I may think that in some sense, Trump is quite complicit here. I don't think he's I, I don't think there's a, a case for incitement in the legal sense of the term. Apparently, it's very, very hard to win a case of incitement in a strictly legal sense. But but, but there are definitely ways I think he's he's culpable. But that's my perspective. If you're a Trump supporter, you're looking for reasons to separate him and the mainstream of his followers and even the mainstream of the people at that rally from yeah. the people in the Capitol. And people just naturally do that. I, I mean, they just naturally try to, to disassociate the bulk of the movement they support from the people who do bad things. And that's, and I think, I just think, you know, a hobby horse of mine is that the, the big problem in the world, whether on the international stage or the national stage is, the difficulty people naturally have viewing things from the point of view on the other side of some tribal divide. Yeah. And I just wish we would all do a better job of that right now because, you know, you've mentioned 9-11 a couple of times. And here, one of the analogies I see is that our overreaction to 9-11 fed right into the narrative of the terrorists, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we attacked the we invaded countries and blah, blah, blah. And if you look at the what turned out to be the real uh, pro security threat to the extent that there was one from terrorism was not so much any more people coming in from the outside as it happened on 9-11. It was kind of homegrown terrorism. Uh, and time and again, if you looked at what pretty clearly motivated the terrorists, it was our overreaction to 9-11. Yeah. It was some combination of us bombing, uh, you know, Middle Eastern countries and killing Muslims and maybe surveillance of mosques, but but it was we the reaction fed right into the narrative of what we thought of as the enemy. And I would really encourage people to examine what the narrative is that gives uh, Trump's movement power to begin with. Yeah. It's that, uh, you know, 
these big corporations, uh, they don't care about the little guy. They care about their money and their global connections and their elite friends. They don't care about uh, the little guy. And so now they are looking up and seeing these big corporations like like Facebook and Google uh, squash them. Um, and and the other the other thing is they're like, well, so social media is cracking down because they say we're saying things that aren't true or something. Well, we think the New York Times has been saying things that aren't true. And I, I've got to say, my own view is it, it, it's not so much that uh, the Times and other kind of uh, mainstream outlets have promulgated a whole lot of flat out untruths. But I do think without trying to, they, in effect, in a way, joined the resistance and cast their headlines the way somebody in the resistance would want the headlines to read and cast. Well, and even more to the point, right, you had Twitter, I think it was, and I don't remember if Facebook followed, but, um, you know, not allowing the New York Post to um, to post after it ran that piece about um, Hunter Biden, Hunter Biden. Right. Right. And it certainly never has engaged in heavy handed um, things like that with uh, and obviously the mainstream media has, you know, reported all sorts right. of stories. That and that Hunter Biden changed. story was probably true insofar as it went. I mean, there there Maybe, was a yeah. moment there when everybody was saying, no, no, this is Russian disinformation. Now, I, I think it's pretty clear that whether that was his computer or not, those were the contents of his hard drive. Those were real yeah. emails. I wonder what you think about um, if you were writing articles of impeachment for Trump. I don't know if you think he should be impeached or not. Um, but... Um, but thinking about what would be the best way to write those articles of impeachment, you could kind of mm-hmm. tell two stories about what happened that day. Um, in one story, um, I, I, I agree with you that you could not you could not convict Trump of incitement in a court of law. Um, I think that and I would not want you to be able to convict him in a court of law, um, given the kind of logical leaps that you would have to make and the way that those could be applied in other cases. Um at the same time, I think it's pretty clear that um, through negligence, if not willfully, he did uh, incite the crowd to go um, do exactly what they did, that, that, you know, the effect of his words were what happened. And, but for him, it would not have happened. Uh, and you could, you could tell a story that kind of hammered his complicity home and portrayed um, the people as a dangerous mob who really, you know, were an attempted coup, say, you could use that word instead of insurrection. Um, And you could emphasize certain things in that way. The other story that you could tell, a very different story, right, is that um, Trump may not have uh, been thinking, I want these people to literally break into the Capitol, but um, he did flagrantly lie to them, rile them up, um, and do so in a way where he's the president saying we're going to march over to the Capitol now in a way that showed gross negligence, uh, gross negligence that had a terrible effect. Uh, and not only that, but whatever we think about his speech, once the um, once people did start mobbing the Capitol, he disappeared. He wasn't immediately trying to send all of the help uh, that was needed in order to stop this. Oh, it's attack. worse than that. It's right? worse than that. Uh, well, maybe it is worse than that, but at the very least, right. Um, you could say in this story of impeachment, um, our democratic institutions were being attacked and the president um, yeah. w- was nowhere to be seen. What if this would have been um, a, you know, a small foreign special forces that, that went mm-hmm. into the Capitol one day, right? Um, this is the whole reason that we have a president constructed as it is, is to have an energetic response in moments like this to protect democracy and, um you know, Trump failed to do this against the most ridiculous ragtag group of, of insurrectionists that the world has ever seen. Uh, what if they would have been more organized? We can't mm-hmm. afford to have someone who is unable to protect America in office. So that's a different story that you could tell that I think would be um, more palatable to a lot of people than look at the text of his words. He obviously intended a coup and incited. This. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, in, in response to your question is whether I think impeachment is in order. I, I don't think it's a good idea politically. You never it's you never know what the consequences will be. But I feel kind of like I do about the first impeachment. You could justify it because, after all, you don't you don't you don't have to claim that an actual law was 
broken. I mean, high crimes and misdemeanors is construed more broadly than that. But I, I was skeptical that it was a good idea politically. I'm more convinced than ever that it wasn't. And I tend to think that now it's an, it, 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 impeachment's a bad idea. But leaving that aside, I think there's a very strong case for it. I agree with you that it wouldn't be specific things he said during that speech, drove these people over there. In fact, one thing that his defenders are now saying, and this is an example of how listening to Steve Bannon podcast puts you ahead of the curve, <laughs> uh, they've now done the timeline and established that I, I think when the defenses were first breached, the people would not have had time to walk over from the rally if they waited until the very end when he exhorted them to go over there. So there were, you know, there were there were people uh, doing this before that. Of course, on the other hand, in, in theory, they could have been listening to him on their smartphones. But but all that aside, I would say, uh, first of all, when I said uh, interrupted you and said it's even worse than that, it, it, the most. uh explicit case of incitement in my mind took case took place once the the protesters they were in the capitol he had to know they were there they had been in there for a while and he not only didn't tweet hey cool it he tweeted and 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 you know who knows i don't know if he knew whether or not mike pence had been evacuated but for all he knew mike pence was either in the capitol or in some place uh, accessible via the Capitol, you know, uh, through an underground tunnel. And he tweeted that Mike Pence has failed to defend his country and the Constitution. In other words, while they were in there, he called his vice president, in effect, a traitor. And they caught wind of that. They caught wind of that. And, I mean, they were already riled about Pence. Yeah. Another thing he had done, by the way, is is during the speech he had said, well, we'll have to find out what Pence does. It's all up to Pence. He already knew at that. Pence had told him at that point what was going to happen. So he was falsely ginning up this drama <laughs> and, and and knowing that I'm going to send them over there and they're going to be very disappointed. They're going to be in a very bad mood. But but to me, the worst single thing he did um, is that virtually inciting them to go find Pence and, and kill him, which some of them were trying to do. And yeah. to me... The the fact that this has not gotten more emphasis from Democrats is a failure in a couple of senses. First of all, it's pretty clear cut. Secondly, it, it, don't they understand it's like particularly good to view Mike Pence, his Republican vice president, right. as one of his victims and not just act like you're pissed because you had to take shelter, right? Yeah. It, it, it's So anyway, I mean, I think, as I earlier said, I think the larger... Uh, thing to say is that, look, he has been, you know, every time he has uh, said something not true, you know, the claim that there was some kind of widespread fraud that's uh, uh, for which there's overwhelming evidence. Uh, and every time he's um, depicted uh, these people as the enemy and every time he's done X, Y and Z, he has, in effect, been encouraging this kind of thing. To me, all of that is adequate for impeachment. I still don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I agree so, with you. The so focus you shouldn't think? be on what he said exactly at the Capitol. He even threw in the word peacefully at the end after he told him to go to the Capitol. He said, so you I, know. I, I think I understand your perspective uh, that, that impeachment would um, do more harm than good, that it's a, a delicate moment. We, we, we don't want to throw any more gasoline on it. But... What do you say to the counter argument that, uh, you know, given what you just described about what he did with Pence, right, um, if, if this isn't a moment to remove the president for a high crime, what is um, like like surely it crosses that threshold and there's some cost in um, the legislative branch not standing up and saying this is an attack on our branch of government and it, it can't stand. Well, I think one thing you do uh, is, I mean, and you know, there's been talk of impeaching him after he leaves. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, you know, there's a kind of a, I mean, part of the problem is, look, they're not going to get a conviction. Yeah. It's a, so, so, I mean, it's not going to set the precedent you would like. Yeah. Well, that's the question. I, I agree with that, that if, if there's not going to be a conviction, it would be foolhardy to do it. Um, There's not going to be one if they do it now. And maybe things could change if they hold off for a few months, conceivably politically. I don't see it. 
Yeah. And, and 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 one reason I don't see it is because they're doing things like impeaching and deplatforming and energizing his narrative. Yeah. I think that the worst thing that they could do, actually, that I've seen aired in different places is these calls to expel members from Congress. Um, to me, that would be a disaster. That is yeah. just basically sending the message that um, the you know, you can no longer work through the electoral system um, in order to get the representatives you want and air your grievances. Yeah. And that just causes people to uh, to use other means, which is exactly what we don't but, want. But if you're, if you're talking about messages to be sent, I think if you just left things alone um, and let him stew in his own juice without giving him a new enemy and without yeah. giving his base a new enemy, the story would be that, you know, uh, he ended his political career, in effect, by doing this. Yeah. And that's not may, – maybe you would like to send a stronger message. The other thing you should do is, of course, arrest a whole bunch of people who are in the Capitol, which, yeah. you know, and then at last, at last count, there were almost 100 arrested. You should arrest a whole bunch. You should put them in jail about as long as you can in most cases and, and, and uh, send the message that way. But, I mean, you know – Well, so this is a question – I agree with – I agree with that um, – to me, the the sweet spot, it, like the way to talk about this, is that you send these people to, um, you send these people to jail. Uh, you do it, you know. Joe Biden should do it in sorrow more than anger, right? And all Democrats and the Republicans who are against Trump should emphasize the degree to which Trump betrayed the people on the lawn that day, the ones that stormed the Capitol, and the ones that didn't. Pence, right? Um, the betrayal, the lack of loyalty, I think that um, I think the Democrats often underestimate how much movement conservatives and staunch Republicans value loyalty as a moral kind of um, foundation more than some people on the left do. Um, you know, I think Heights work kind of bears that out. And um, I'm sorry, you know, you're saying that people on the right do do that. value loyalty, uh, put it higher in their kind of moral foundations, sometimes even than than care harm in a way that is, is less common on the left, or at least mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of my read of the research. And, um, y you know, I mean, like we both know, right, that if someone were to suggest that, um, you know, Trump ought to show his appreciation for the people who supported him but didn't storm the Capitol by welcoming them to his resorts and hotels, right? These are the last people that Trump wants mm -hmm. hanging around his fancy properties, right? There is a truthful um, wedge to be exploited here that is, look at how little regard Trump has for these people. He goes, he eggs them on to do these things that wound them up in jail for, um, you know, years and years. He turns around and denounces them the next moment when it's in his political interest to do so. He eggs people on to go after Pence when he is possibly in physical danger, um, and it's the story of his life. The same guy who was disloyal to every woman he ever married, to his family when they were fighting about inheritances, to every contractor he ever hired. This guy has been bamboozling you um, all along. And um, I, I don't see a lot of that message. I see a lot of um, you're all one basket of deplorables and we're going to stigmatize and shun you. And it's a little bit tricky because you do want to stigmatize people who rush the Capitol building. And I get that. Mm -hmm. I think there are different ways to do it and that um, they're not going about it in the, in the, in the best way. I don't think. Um, yeah. Do I agree. Of that woman who um, did you see the video of the woman with the piano key scarf who is getting interviewed and she said, you know, the reporter says what happened and she says, I got maced. And he says, uh, were you trying to go into the Capitol? And she says, yeah, I got maced right when I, right when I stuck my head across the threshold. And he said, what were you doing? And she looked at him like he was crazy, but said kind of like dejected and tearfully because of the mace, uh, something like, um, we're, we're storming the Capitol. It's a revolution, right? Yeah. So this is someone who um, weirdly storms the Capitol and is surprised to get maced. <laughs> and, and and the mace right is all that it takes to turn her around from the revolution, right? Like she didn't right. got to collect herself and go back in. And then she's kind of like relating this, how she traveled from Texas to this reporter and her husband is standing next to her and she doesn't know that she's incriminating herself, that something that could send her to jail for you, right? 
how long do you send this delusional lady to prison for? It's an, I think it's a very hard question. Well, I agree. And I think you want to, you, you need to be careful about that. But look, in a way, that's the least of our worries. Right now, it looks like our reaction is going to go so far beyond putting a bunch of those people in jail, right? right. That, and, 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 and damage us in those ways. And, and, you know, you said, well, uh, I really want to dwell on the fact that, like, Trump was in the process of getting his comeuppance in a, in a sense. I mean, for example, the PGA, uh, which is a pretty on balance Republican conservative thing. Yeah. Has canceled its agreement. They were going to hold the PGA championship at his uh, New Jersey golf course in two years. They've canceled that. There's like a lot of, he was going to suffer a lot of actual commercial damage. Yeah. Political damage. And I, I mean, I know you're like, but don't we need to officially send some super strong signal? Well, I'd love to, but I would also say that when your country is in as volatile a situation as we seem to be in, I would pay a lot of attention to the short-term consequences of what you do and whether it is going to escalate things or not. I mean, I saw a tweet, and I don't know, uh, this was an ABC News report today. Today is Monday. This will go up. Uh, our conversation will go up on Tuesday. Yeah. Um Armed protests are being planned at all 50 state capitals from 16th January through at least 20th January and at the U.S. Capitol from 17th January through 20th January. That accordingly is, is, a, is supposedly is according to the FBI. Uh, I don't know about that may be overstating it, but the point is the, the you know, there there are a number of kind of crazy people yeah. and it doesn't take too much interaction between crazy people on both sides yeah. Before you have a very serious problem on your hands. So I would look, I mean, I would count your blessings if you're a Democrat. Hey, you won those two Senate races. And by the way, Trump is blamed for that. You yeah. know, he was he was just, you know, as of uh, Wednesday at like 6 p.m. with the storming of the Capitol having happened, the Georgia election having happened. His name was Mud. Yeah, that's that's not a bad outcome. OK, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. There's a Southern group of people, right, who are in a kind of different position than the Democrats you're talking about. And that's the kind of never Trump faction in the Republican Party who would like to rescue it and steer it in a more constructive way going forward. And they see this as a moment where, um, you know, Cruz and Holly and all of the people who are lying to the base um to, you know, exploit their fantasies and never deliver anything, this is the chance for their comeuppance. And this is the chance to kind of seize back the party and steer it in a different direction. I don't know if it is a chance for that or not, or, or what they should do strategically. Um, but it's definitely um, a different wrinkle. And I think that, you know, certainly um, the Lincoln Project people and Bill Crystal and others are going to keep making noise in the public square. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that is that is trying to marginalize uh, these people and seize the advantage. Um, can I just can I just briefly course. point out that by and large these are the same people who confidently advocated the response to 9/11 that was oh, yeah. disastrous in ways yeah. that are very parallel to what I'm warning about here. Yes, exact same people. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know I. I hope that cooler heads will prevail about the terrorism law. I saw that a, a couple, like, who was it? One member of the squad um, tweeted immediate opposition to it. And, uh, but, you know, um, Harris and Biden both have a history of the kind of prosecutorial zeal crackdown on um, disorder. And I wonder how it's going to play out. I wonder um, I, I actually wonder what the people in Portland storming the courthouse, the Antifa people are thinking right now. If this is going to uh, undercut their um, ability to kind of um, do what they do with impunity, right? Wait, what, what is going to undercut that? Uh, this sudden turn toward law and order rhetoric in the Democratic Party, right? Um, it, like, you know, I kind of highlighted the ways in which you can go back and look at like certain Vox pieces that look hypocritical now, uh, given what people are saying about the importance of law and order and symbols and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, 
I do think that that matters going forward, that if you're um, a Democratic mayor who wants to crack down a little bit more on protests in your city, um, you're in a better position to do that now, I think, than you were before all of this happened. Um, you know? Um, yeah, that's true. At the same time, if there is, uh, you know, if the kind of a harsh reaction against Trump and Trumpists in response to this um, does incite a lot of unrest from the far right, there are people in Antifa who welcome that. Yeah, that's the enemy. Bring it on. You know, yeah. they, they're the ones whose whose violent engagement with these people uh, could could become a big problem. So how did we get from this moment in American history back in the era of the weather underground and the kind of tumult of the late 60s, right, to this moment that was four years before I was born in 1976, when there are all these bicentennial celebrations and waving the flag and <laughs> this moment of what appears, if you just look narrowly at, at that year, to be a moment of relative unity, Um like, like how did how did things? I, kind I of- should know because oh, unlike yeah. you, I remember I remember the weather, man. In fact, I was living in San Francisco during the high, from nineteen sixty eight through nineteen seventy one. I mean, granted, I was like you know twelve, thirteen years old, but I was paying attention. And one thing I will say is that though things felt very unstable then. And all the more so for me because my father was in the army. I was living on the Presidio in San Francisco, which was a military base. And like everyone was like – there were these huge demonstrations like against the army. Yeah. So it, it very much felt like my world was being shaken. But I've got to say it never felt to me as precarious as this feels. It certainly wasn't the same kind of thing because for one thing, it at least seemed to be more of an intergenerational conflict. I'm not saying it was, if you look at the opinion on Vietnam, I'm not saying it was, but if you yeah. looked at like who was out in the streets yeah. and, you know, um, it seemed more intergenerational. It, it never seemed quite like this. Now there was a famous uh, confrontation of between construction workers and protesters. The hard hats weighed, went into, weighed into the demonstration and beat, beat these people up. I'm not saying it never got, Creepy, you know, and, and the things between the cops and the Black Panthers got very, you know, cops basically murdered, uh, I guess, Fred Hampton in, in Chicago. Um, but, uh, and, and maybe it's hard to say. I, like I said, I was young, but I was really paying attention and it didn't, it didn't feel like this. For one thing, there wasn't the, seemingly there wasn't the geographic dimension there, there, there is now. Not that even this is really red state, blue state, but it is kind of, urban versus rural. Yeah. It, 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 uh, and, you know, there would have been some correlation back then as well, but I, I, all I can tell you is, in yeah. a certain sense, this, your question was how it all got resolved. Well, for one thing, the Vietnam War ended. Remember, one of the main sources of fuel was the Vietnam War. Yeah. Was Vietnam. And I mean, the main kind of agitators were these college students who were the ones who were going to be sent to Vietnam and die. Yeah. You know, or their friends. They didn't like that. Well, the yeah. war ended. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm increasingly convinced that at least a part of what's fueling this, even though it's seldom discussed, is the backdrop of the pandemic. And a lot of people who are out of work, who've seen their small mm-hmm. business shuttered, who just uh, don't like that they can't go to the places that they routinely went. And and oh, know, yeah. some people think that the virus is not even real. Others who think that it is real, but we're losing all of our freedoms. And um, I I mean, I'm kind of mystified that there isn't – that vaccinating people faster isn't being treated as more of an emergency. Um, I, I have big fears about the new seemingly more contagious variant um, that seems to have gotten to other countries um, before here. It, it's certainly already here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but – Um, you know, as someone who has been relatively okay with various business closures and stuff, um, I think it could really radicalize people, um, another degree if Biden takes office and then there's a bunch of new infections and then there's an attempt to shut things down again Mm -hmm. in a kind of more sustained nationwide way. Um, 
I, I both understand why there might be that. And I also think it would just pour gasoline onto the political instability and that the kind of only way out of this is, you know, if it were up to me, there would be 24 seven inoculations. We would have already approved yeah. the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, we would speed the Johnson and Johnson along as much as possible. We totally. would do one dose instead of two doses with Pfizer and Moderna. And, um, Otherwise, we are going to face this choice of, you know, tens of thousands of people dying um, Mm -hmm. or a lockdown that may not even be effective and is going to radicalize people. Uh, So I think it's going to be a a very fraught few months ahead, even apart from the from the mere political instability or the the political instability alone. Well, there has been this interaction between the two all along. The pandemic and polarization have made each other worse. The um, I think that's possible. I'm guardedly optimistic. Uh, I mean, it's definitely bad that there is now this variant that's 50 percent more transmissible. That's bad. At least 50 percent, I guess. Um, the but I do think I mean, first of all, you would expect a kind of a stumbling start to the vaccination program, all the more so since, you know, it's a Trump operation. Let's face it. It's not an administration staffed by the best and the brightest. He himself is a picture of incompetence. Um. So so I think both because it's in the natural order of things for us to get better and better at these kinds of things and because Biden's uh, administration will be more efficient, um, I, I think you'll you'll start seeing vaccination rates increase. I, I'm guessing within a couple of months we'll feel that uh, the, tor- the corner has been turned. Maybe I'm naive. Uh, I, I worry more about the enduring uh, state of the enduring difference of perspectives on the two sides. I mean, I, I think one of the great challenges that, so far as I can tell, nobody's taking seriously is to make whatever inroads you can, however limited they may be, to convince some people who are currently sure that the election was stolen, yeah. that at least it's more complicated than that. I mean, if you can if you can reduce that number by three percent, that's progress. And it could be critical progress at some point during an election or something. I I don't, again, I, I try to spend some time in the right-wing ecosystem. And I'm telling you, I mean, one reason people on our side kind of, or kind of Democrats or whoever, whatever your side is, um, the anti, the non-Trump side, dismiss these people is they're like, what's the point of trying to talk to them? They got to be crazy. And I'm telling you, if you, look, we spend our time in a left of center ecosystem. And if you spent your time in that right of center ecosystem, and especially certain parts of it, you would be convinced. You would be convinced uh, mm-hmm. that the election was stolen. It yeah. isn't that they're all crazy. It's that they're in a different world. And and it's worth trying to, um, to bring some of them back and in the process acknowledge that, look, there are good questions about the election and how it was conducted. It's just that as a matter of law... The results have to be respected. You tried all the legitimate avenues and you failed. Do you know um, the book uh do you know the book Private Truths Public Lies? I've heard the title, but it's really good. I, I highly recommend it. Um it's 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 basically a book about preference falsification mm-hmm. and the way in which because most people don't have the ability to sway any given political question with their opinion alone, um they kind of falsify their their public expression of beliefs mm-hmm. go along with whatever um, the prevailing thing seems to be. Right. And I think that people sense on an intuitive level that this happens. And one thing that happens on social media is that um, the kind of point that you are making, that if you were on, on the other side of this and this other ecosystem, you might have these kinds of um, views about things. They're not all crazy. They're not all, um, you know, morally inferior, to make that kind of point on social media today, you get a lot of angry pushback. Oh, this is false equivalence, or you're trying to launder them. You're not, me. and it's because people on social media um, are trying to game this larger system, right? They're trying to each one of them be little political actors that sway the Overton window or that sway the what seemingly public opinion is, because they recognize that on some level this causes people to change their own behavior if they think this is where the stigma is being directed. Um, I think that they correctly sense that there is power in this. At the same time, it makes it very difficult to have public conversations that 
are aimed to get at subtle truths or that are aimed at building empathy. And um, I don't know if there are changes to the architecture of social media platforms that would change this. If there's, you know, I've, I don't know if you've ever gone on TikTok. Um, A little bit. It's very, worth very engrossing. <laughs> it's worth going on uh, if you've never been on it only because it shows you how a totally different architecture brings out different kinds of content. And it really does. I, I think it, it really is a very different um, platform than the ones we mainly use now. Well, it's an entertainment medium, right? I mean, it's not a political medium. Well, even the political videos that are there, um, it's a medium that selects for delighting people instead of outraging people, right? Um, and so because there's no dunk retweets, because there's no ratios, um, it, it doesn't have all of these things that, that incentivize people to behave in um, conflict-raising ways. Yeah. And um, much more you're trying to appeal to the delight of the average reasonable person instead of attracting the boosts of the angriest people, right? And it, it really makes a difference. It's, I mean, it's funny that the, the, the like social media platform that is um, most attached to our geopolitical rival is, is one that is perhaps doing the least damage in terms of its architecture. That's and, funny. And it, that, that's funny. Speed. Yeah. Trump, Trump was for a while trying to kill it. Uh, yeah. The um, yeah. Uh, well, so we, I don't know. Do you, is there anything else you want to say on this? So we could resume this conversation. Uh, but is there any, 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 uh, punctuation you want to put on this for now? I guess I would just say, um, I, I would just appeal to people that, um, if there is ever a moment, and this, this will definitely be, if there's ever a moment for the, uh, Bob Wright credo of trying to, um, tamp down tensions and have empathy um, a moment of political instability in the middle of a pandemic when a lot of people are suffering is it. And, um, and I, th I really think that one thing that, that could be more constructive is for people with um, moderate sensibilities. It doesn't mean you're a centrist politically, but just moderate sensibilities in general get over their aversion to the um, immoderation of the public sphere and participate more. Um, so if you're an independent or a never Trump Republican, it means voting in primaries, right? And maybe it just means when you're on social media, instead of being like, I can't deal with this ugliness, just like chime in as a voice of moderation. Um, I think we need people um, who I think are the majority of people to be exercising more influence instead of abandoning the public sphere because it seems so ugly. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll second all that. And I'll, and I'll, uh, I mean, thanks for plugging my worldview. I'll, I'll add that, you know, empathy, which I am a big advocate of, uh, but there are two, two kinds. There's cognitive empathy and emotional empathy. And the main kind of an, I, I'm an advocate of is just cognitive empathy. I'm not even asking for you to feel their pain or care about their pain, but just, adopting, trying to understand how the world looks from the other yeah. side. Now, you may find that makes you more sympathetic to them and more worried about their pain. You, you may not, but just from a, just for the, just to inform your own tactics. I mean, if you think Trumpism is bad uh, and you want to fight it, well, at least start out by understanding the perspective from that, uh, from that tribe, from that side. And you know what, what, bothers me. I mean, I, I probably sounded uh, fairly confident that like impeachment's a bad idea politically or that deplatforming is or whatever. I don't feel confident. Of, it, they're too complicated to feel confident about. What I feel confident about is that it is troubling how little reflection seems to have gone into these decisions, including trying to look at how they're going to play on the other side. And uh, that that I I am sure of is, is that these things seem to me to have been emotionally driven, and, and not driven uh, by careful reflection, informed by kind of perspective taking, just understanding the other tribe. That that I'm willing to. Yeah, that's a hill I'm willing to die on. So Connor, thank you. Uh, where uh, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's at Connor sixty four. I have a page at the Atlantic with. 99% of the stuff I write and the newsletter is the best of journalism. Uh, there's a link in my Twitter profile to it. 
And uh, yeah, that's what and I that's do online. Cr- that's Connor with one N. So C O N O R, the digit six, the digit four. Yep. Uh, I'm at Robert Ryder, W R I G H T E R on Twitter. This is the right show. Rate and review it and so on. Um, and l- let's try to resume and this conversation. Sign up for the Mindful Resistance newsletter. You forgot. Well, that. actually, we've, it's now, it's been rebranded as the non zero newsletter, uh, but that's a, it's a good plug because we're about to create a paid version of it. Meanwhile, people can go to nonzero.org or just Google non-zero and Substack. It, it is also on the Substack platform and you can sign up for free. There will always be a free version. Um, although there will uh, before long be a paid version and your newsletter remind us again, it's uh, the best of journalism. Best of journalism. Yes. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, um, to the parrot. I hope the parrot room isn't in any danger from big tech and it's sensorious impulses. <laughs> the parrot room. Well, you should say I do this weekly podcast with Mickey Kaus, an actual Trump supporter. Such is my o- open mindedness. Um, and we, yeah, we have a Patreon and Patreon uh, supporters uh, who go to patreon.com slash parrot room uh, can listen not only to the weekly podcast, but also the after hours uh, thing in the parrot room. Thank it's you for that plug. Me. Yeah. Thank All you right. for that plug. Okay. So we will, let, let, let's do make a point of resuming the conversation. This is, this is, uh, I, I've enjoyed this. I, I, I think it's been productive. All right. Good talking to you, Bob. Same here.